Despite the length of this video, studio lighting in Blender is actually pretty simple to do. So first we wanna set up our camera and basic angle and everything. So add in a camera and I want my uh, camera to be pretty front on. So in front view mode, if I hit control alt is number pad zero, it's gonna snap the view directly to this view. Um, now the focal length of this camera can play a pretty big role in how things are perceived. If you go for a low focal length, it kind of looks like that wide lens like you know skateboard videos and that emphasizes the depth of an object and then if you go uh, the other direction and go too far forward it can kind of flatten the depth so that's kind of the difference so I want to go somewhere in between it um, 50 is sort of the neutral one but I find for something like furniture it does kind of make things closer to it a little too emphasized so I'm going to go 100 like that 100 millimeters and then uh, front on is pretty boring so let's just rotate our chair uh, so just hitting R and then Z R Z and uh, rotate it side on like that about 20 degrees all right and then I want the camera up so that I can just see like the top of the seat here and uh, if I was to rotate the camera and, you know, do it down like this, that that's okay. But it can also create kind of like a bit of a bar not bar is it barrel distortion? No, it's like perspective distortion. Uh, but this is a little trick I learned. You can use shift Y and X, uh, which will actually create, like if you rendered like a large image and then just cropped it to that little bit, it's that effect. I'll put a, if you click the little eye up there, you can watch a video that I, I found on it that's pretty good. But anyways, for that, that's pretty good, nice. Okay, so let's talk about uh, lighting. So if we went into rendered view mode, we would see this, which is not very thrilling. Uh, why can't I, oh, there we go. Uh, so it does have some light and that is because the world uh, has a default gray color to it. So I actually wanna turn that off to set the strength to zero so that all my lighting is gonna come from lights in the scene. So let's add in our first lamp. So shift A, go light point lamp like so. Um, okay, so this lamp, if we were to uh, put it you know, front onto the camera, it would show us the chair, but it wouldn't reveal its form because it's hiding the shadow. The shadow is obviously being cast behind, which we can't see. So equally as important to light is its shadow. And I'll say that again, shadow is equally as important to light. So don't fear shadow, it's a common beginner mistake. So uh, we want to position our light so that it is creating some form of shadow on it. Um, and you can see that with the light, round about here, we've got shadow on this side, so it's showing that the object's three-dimensional like a box, but there's no shadow across this curve here, so it's not easy for us to see that this is a curved backing. So this is where the light placement um, is very important. So let's just split my view here so that I can go into top view. Now, if I was to move my light a little bit to the side, um, you can see we're starting to get some shadow there. Now let me, now that we're doing this, uh, increase the light brightness. Okay, something like that. So I want there to be just a little bit of shadow coming off the uh, the curve there so that I can see, uh, see the form of that back there. Um, and if I wanted to light up the seat a little bit more, then I could increase that. And you can also see that that changes the position of the reflection as well. So reflection for some objects is more important than the actual lights itself because like if you're lighting a... Uh, What's something like a, let's say like a knight in shining armor that's fully chrome or whatever. Um, you wouldn't actually see, like light wouldn't matter. It would be purely reflection. So that that's an example of where reflections are really important. So anyways, in this case, uh, the reflection, I don't want it to be like down here because it can make the lip of this look too emphasized. So I want it to be up a little bit and it's also creating some shadow across. Uh, it's lighting the top of my chair there. So that is desirable. That's what I want. Lovely. Okay. Now. Before we go adding any more lights in, because you know you can see that the right side of this is dark, um, but we, we want our chair to be sitting on something, right? To look like it's in a studio environment. And that can actually contribute to the light because it'll bounce off it. So might as well add in a floor while we can. I mean, sooner rather than later. Anyway, so I'm just adding in a plane here and that's good. We've got shadow. We've even got some bounce coming off the plane there, which is nice. Um, however, I want that to, uh, I want it to look like there's an infinite background, right? Uh, not this jutting line there because that can, you know, if you can imagine 
like that can disrupt the, the look of this object here. So it's very common. A lot of photographers shoot on an infinite background. When I was first starting uh, with Blender, I thought like the, the solution to this was to like, you know, make this plane absolutely huge and then add a sun lamp to light it all up. And that was completely the wrong way to go about it. It's so much simpler than that. All you need to do is just select one edge of your plane, uh, extrude that up. So E and then Z like so. Um, and that's pretty good. However, there's still the line there. So all we need to do is add a bevel. So bevel modifier, bevel, and uh, you can see we get this. Now, if we increase the segments here, watch what happens to that line. It just disappears. And uh, that's pretty good. But then if we right click and go shade smooth, it's virtually vanished. And if you can still see it, you can also just play with this offset and like increase that. Um, and that can play a big role. Um, the other thing as well is you'll notice that uh, the light isn't even across this, right? So there is more light hitting this section than there is hitting this section. So there's a big fall off between those two points there. Um, and this is called the inverse fall off. In Inverse square law. So I talked about this in my full lighting series, uh, which you can watch by clicking up there, um, that goes into all about the science of lighting and all that stuff. Um, but this, just the basics of it, every time distance doubles. So for example, the distance between this light here and uh, this chair, and then let's say an equal point over here, uh, the, the, the fall off is four times from here to there which is crazy, but it is true. So essentially it means that uh, small amounts of distance uh, can actually have really large fall off depending on how far away the light is from the source. So given how close this is to the light there, we're getting a lot of fall off. So the solution is either to bring this in really, really close, but you can still getting some fall off happening um, or, and this is the solution I'm gonna do, is just move the light source further away. And now when I do this, obviously I need to increase the brightness, but the fall off will be less because there is less of a distance fall off between now from like uh, there to there. It's not like f that far away, right? So the further away I make this and then increase this, uh, the more even the light in the backdrop is gonna be. And let me turn off, or well, let's just erase those annotations. There we go. So you can see that that light is now completely even going across here. Um, and that is good. I'll just also, uh, raise that up so that I'm still getting some light across across the bow, the bow of the seat. I don't know, I'll just call it that. Uh, and that's pretty good, that's not bad. So as I mentioned, we are getting some bounce lighting coming off of this plane here. Before it was like totally dark there because just like in space, there's nothing for light to reflect off of. So you actually get a completely black, uh, it's completely black on the dark side of the moon. There's nothing to reflect off it. So therefore it is completely black uh, with something there. We can see it's a totally different effect. Uh, by the way, check it out. I've got a uh, viewport denoising this uh, new feature in Blender 2.83 beta. Uh, there it is. Optics AI viewport denoising. And it is so cool. I'm really happy. I think other software's had it for like a couple of years, but Blender just got it. It only works with RTX cards, just uh, FYI, but I didn't think it was gonna make that big of a difference, but I'm really, I, I love it. So now I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna use it for everything. So when we're playing with the, the energy value of a light, we're, we're basically making the decision of like, is this lit enough? Is it overly lit? Like if you go too high, you can go like, oh yeah, that looks a little bit too bright versus going a little bit too low and it looks a little bit too dark. But there is a tool in Blender that helps you see this better. And that's underneath color management, um, you can see, by default, the view transform is filmic, which is what you should always use. Definitely don't change for a final render off that. Um, but you can choose false color, and this will actually show you kind of like a heat map of the exposure ranges of the image. So gray, which is usually like a, a slither, right? Like that little gray value there. That's something that's properly exposed at kind of like zero EV. Um, and then if you go into the slightly cyan color or aqua color, that's like one stop under. And then a hot green color is one stop over. And then obviously like yellow and then red is even uh, more and more overexposed. And you can actually see this when you change uh, the exposure range there. So essentially, the way I look at it is as long as there is uh, a gray value somewhere on my model, I know that I'm in the range where it is, uh, where it's acceptable. The other thing while we're talking about color management is uh, 
Generally, Blender tends to look a little bit washed out. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that the look that it applies to it by default is kind of like medium contrast. So the look here, it says none, but it's actually identical to medium contrast. If you change that to high contrast, you'll see that it almost immediately improves it. Um, so whenever I'm doing anything, basically, I always change my look to high contrast and uh, it improves it immensely. Like it's just, there's never really a case where I don't want to use high contrast. Uh, very high, kind of just like it punches out. It, yeah, it's the shadows become darker, the highlights become brighter. Very high is a little bit too extreme. I just generally find high looks pretty good. Um, but there you go. And then you can play with exposure if you've, you know, as opposed to changing the power of the light, it's the exact same thing, except it's from the camera's point of view. So every light source would have an effect of that. But anyways, that's pretty good. That's, that's not bad. It's kind of got that like bleached, like uh, stark studio light kind of look. I might turn that back a little bit. Something I might want to do as well is that this side of this chair here is kind of, it's in the shadows, which is good. You don't want to erase shadows completely, but you do want in some cases to reveal something about it. So maybe I've got like some grain of the wood there that I want to highlight. So I'm going to add another point lamp right here point and this is just going to light up just the side of this chair here so you never want to just add in lights you always want there to be a purpose so make sure you get into the habit of like why am i adding a light like there has to be a reason for it and then you want to isolate that light so i hide any other lights with uh, h and then this light here i can see is yet yeah, the only light from this little point so now i'm just going to play with this light and uh, i just want it to hit the side of that leg there i don't want it to hit this backdrop here because that could uh I could ruin all that perfect uh, that perfect flat lighting that I went to all the trouble of getting. So if I move this behind the backdrop, you can see that I'm really controlling. And over here, now it's really just hitting the side of this leg there. So that's kind of ideal for what I want. And if I change the uh, size of this lamp, it's gonna change how soft that shadow looks. So that's something else uh, I didn't show you, but yeah, the size of the uh, the shadow is very important as well. So let me just get this right. That looks pretty good. Now let's bring back our other light. You can also, a common trick is to make one light source uh, a different color, like you could make it blue. And that's, it's okay, but it can kind of start to look a little bit urban, you know, like if you go like sort of like hot pinks or anything, you know, that look, it's kind of like, like if this was an outdoor furniture, perhaps like a park bench or something that might be what you want, but it, it tends to, things look a little bit funky. It can be done creatively. Yes. But there, I've got a whole video on lighting color if you want to delve into that. But generally if you stick to white um, or at least if you're going to go into color, like keep it to warm or cool, those are the natural tones according to the black body temperature. Uh, but anyways, I might just go slightly cool like that just to make it a little bit interesting, but not in your face. Uh, so quickly the, the size of the shadow, right? So if you look at uh, the shadow coming off this leg here, the size of this lamp source here is being decided by, or it's being shown by the size of uh, this circle around it. So as I change the size here, it's changing that. And that is, you can imagine it like it's a ball of light. And if you were to put a mirror there, you would see that Blender renders that as if it is a solid ball of light. So the larger you make this, just like when you've got an overcast sky, when it's like lighting up a whole cloud, um, the shadows become softer and softer, right? And that can be desirable for some things like generally, the female form, like you don't want to emphasize things that might make you look old, like wrinkles or saggy things or something like that. If you wanted to make a model look younger, you would want to go for, go for soft lighting. Whereas if it was like a masculine male model, perhaps you want to get like some jaw lines or something, you would use a, uh, a sharper light source. So generally the larger the light source, the softer the form kind of hide the detail. Whereas the sharper, the light source, uh, the more the detail is emphasized. So um, in my case, I don't want to go for something like a, you know, like a sun lamp. I don't want it to look like as, as sharp as that. I don't want it also to be like soft, like overcast, but sort of somewhere in between it. Um, I don't know if that's a little bit too exaggerated. I mean, it, there's also no right and wrong answer. Like the trends of like product 
uh, product design. You can see I was just verifying before I talked about the inverse square law. Uh, it is it is a four time reduction, but the trends of studio lighting um, it changes all the time. So uh, yeah, you can go like sometimes people are doing like these sort of sunny photography. Um, they're putting them with like natural materials like concrete and marble. Um, it, it just changes with the times, you know. Uh, the trends of photography like maybe in the old days having like an infinite background was like oh that's crazy cool but now everyone knows how to do it so they're shaking it up with different things um but uh anyway play around with it see what you like something that is quite trendy is to uh change the color of the backdrop to be kind of like uh i don't know like the kanye west uh yeezy pastel kind of this type of color or to like go like 2D fruity. So basically like something desaturated, but like a random color uh, tends to be, yeah, it, it tends to look a little trendy. It looks a little bit more interesting than an infinite white background. So that's something I will do. Let's make it a little bit slightly yeah, saturated like that. And that's pretty cool. I don't know what this says to the viewer. Maybe that it's like childish or playful or it's bold and it's cool. And aren't you cool for buying the cool chair? Um, I don't know, something like that. Like it's all, it's sort of like getting into advertising. Ah, that's kind of cool. I like that, like a pastel. That's kind of nice. So I'll go with that. Um, so let's do the render. Okay, so um let's go eh, 200 samples we'll see how that goes something i do want to use is denoising so in your render passes i'm going to turn on of course in my render passes you'll have to do it at your end uh denoising data um which we'll use in just a second so hit render on that with f12 and there is our render rendered in nine seconds yours might be a little bit longer since i have two rtx titans Ha ha ha, I know. It's, it's like the first time in my life where I have like a computer which is like top speed. I used to be just like a teenager and I'd like save up like 50 bucks for like a card that was five years old. And now Nvidia has given me two of the best cards. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Anyways, so Denoiser, uh, it's underneath filter, Denoise. So you add this in, then you go noisy data, uh, normal, and then Alberto, I wish there was just a checkbox that just built it into the render, but for now it's like a separate node, which is a little bit annoying, but now that cleans up the render, right? So this was this was what it looked like before with a little bit of noise there. And then when you put this through it, uh, it just cleans it up magically, um, which, is, which is great. That's what we want. Okay, now something else as well is that uh, so oftentimes you have so much bounce lighting going on that there isn't as much shadow in the corners of objects as there should be. So for example, like maybe right in here or up here, it can be a little bit brighter than it should be in real life. So something to counter that is ambient occlusion. So if you go into your world properties, you'll see there is a tab here called ambient occlusion. But I don't want you to check the box because if you do that, it'll build it in and it'll like brighten stuff up as well. You wanna leave it unchecked, but the distance there is important. Distance is like how much, how far should it look for an object which is close in order to create extra shadow. 10 meters is insane. I have no idea why, that's the why that is the default value, unless you were making like a city block scene and you needed the different buildings to bounce, like ah, it's crazy high. I'm gonna go for 20 centimeters uh, or 0.2 meters. And then rather than checking the box, if you go to your render passes and then enable ambient occlusion, uh, you need to give it another render and there we go it shouldn't have increased the render time at all really although it has by a half a second or whatever it doesn't matter um if we uh preview what this is by Control shift left clicking until it shows ao you can see that this oh hang on alt v no alt v zoom in there it's uh that's what it's doing it's just adding in extra shadow where there might logically be some. So even like the top, like underside of this chair, it's adding a little bit of shadow on the top of uh, the top of that slat there. So now to combine a uh, almost purely white map, but with slight amounts of darkness to it, you go into, yeah, before your denoise pass, because I guess there would be samples in there. And if we add in a color mix node, drop this in here, 
So make sure noisy image is going into the top input. The bottom input, we want to be the ambient occlusion. And then if we look at this, you'll see that it's just gonna show us the ambient occlusion. But if we set this to multiply, it's only gonna use the dark values and it's gonna ignore the white values. So this is it with nothing. Right, so that if we, oh, actually that, that is a really big difference. So this is with nothing. This is with it turned up to maximum. So it adds like a lot of extra shadow in there. So generally I just sort of choose a value which feels nice. So somewhere around about like a 0.4 can look kind of nice, somewhere 30, 40%. Um, it just adds a little oomph, especially like around the corners of the uh, the chair leg there. It can help it feel a little bit more grounded than it did previously. It kind of feels like it's just sitting in on space a little bit. Whereas if you add a little bit of this oomph, it just a little bit of shadow just helps it feel grounded. Um, it's not as important as it used to be before, um, you know, unbiased rendering and global illumination bounced lighting off everything, but it is still a little bit important. Uh, and finally, because a lot of people were asking how I did the turntable animation, it's so easy that I can throw it in here without ballooning the uh, length of this tutorial. Um, right where my seat is, right there, place my cursor there, and then I'm gonna go Shift A, add in an empty, and this is gonna be the pivot point for my camera. So I take my camera and then I parent it to this empty, Control P, keep transform and now you can see that as i rotate this empty my camera is rotating around it like it is on a circle like a, a circle we used to do, i don't know why i did it years ago but like whenever i used to do this i made like a bezier circle and then i added a transform to look at it and it was like a lot of work and now i realize like why did i do all that you can just add an empty and then rotate the empty so anyways then if you uh i've hidden my timeline but we'll bring it back timeline uh let's go 100 frames home and then go to the first frame and if we add a keyframe here rotation and then if we go to the last frame um actually i want my animation to end there so let's do the inverse of that well let's add a keyframe there and then go to the first frame and then let's make the camera over here. So R and then Z to rotate my empty around it to where I want it to start. And then I'll go I rotation. And now if you play it back, you should see that it pans around, but you can see it like eases into it because it's using Bezier. Uh, it's like ramping up, speeding up and then slowing down. So rather than that, if you just right click with these keyframes uh, selected and then just go uh, interpolation mode linear, now you shouldn't see any uh, any fall off, any uh, Bezier effect. It should be like a constant, something like that. And then we'll just do a render, animate the whole thing. So there you go. Our final uh, animation didn't take too long and uh, looks pretty nice for a minimal amount of work. Uh, as a final outro, I wasn't gonna include this in the tutorial, but you know, might be something that some people want. Uh, I have an add-on called Pro Lighting Studio, which basically does this. You select the object that you want to light, and then there's a bunch of pre-made lighting setups designed off of like professional photographers, uh, general aesthetics, and you can just like quickly cycle through them. So it just kind of adds in the light like for you and does it really quickly. Um, because you often don't know what lighting setup will look good until you see it. So yeah, we basically created this as a way to, yeah, basically trial out uh, a bunch of different lighting setups without having to go to all the work of adding in the lights yourself. Uh, it also adds in like the floor for you. You can add like a, a texture to it. It's designed to be like super fast and you know, does a, does a bunch of interesting stuff. So if you're interested in that, I'll put the link in the description um, and you can check it out. But otherwise, hope you enjoyed this uh, little quick tutorial on making studio lighting setups. Thank you for watching. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you found it useful and I hope to see you in a future video. And if you follow the entire uh, Chair Soborg uh, tutorial series, well done, because that's the finale, the true finale. Uh, you made it right to the end. So uh, congrats on doing that and uh, yeah. Well done. That's all I got to say. <laughs> See you later.